1942, grew up in Mission Hill, one of your better sections of Boston, and uh, 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 went to grade school, trade high school, took uh, automotive, Brighton High School, and then uh, enlisted in the military. That was the way it was supposed to be. That's how, that's how everybody did it. You just, you graduated from high school, you automatically went to service. Most of the family was Marines. My father was in the Navy. I was thinking of the paratroopers, and somehow, as I recall, I went to join the Army. It was down the North End, in Scully Square, the old Scully Square, they had a, an Army booth there. And the uh, sergeant said, uh, uh, as I was walking in the door, he says, come back in an hour and a half, an hour, I'm going to lunch. And I was with another guy, and you know, we were, at that age, we were, you know, all, all you know, full of ourselves. So he said, uh, we can't wait an hour, let's get on and join the Navy. So we, we walked down to the Fargo building and joined the Navy, and that was, you know. So it wasn't, it wasn't that, uh, I guess you could say we didn't put too much thought into it. Then the thinking came after that. Then you said to yourself, geez, what did I do? I just joined the service. You know, I remember my, uh, my mother said something funny that I never forgot. I said, Mom, I joined the Navy. She said, uh, you can't go in. She says, you look terrible in black. <laughs> I said, well, it's, it's really, it's not black, it's navy blue. Now I'm trying to pacify her. She says, well, she says, uh, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't have wool on you. She says, you're witch. And I, I, I thought about that. I said, geez, I didn't think about that, the wool. But as it turned out. But that was, uh, that was one thing that stuck in my head when I told her I was going to the service. They were, they were supportive, uh, and, uh, and at the same time, um, my mother didn't want me to go in. I don't think mothers ever want sons to go in. Um, as far as, you know, the older brothers and, and fathers, I think they think, uh, it'll do them good, let them go, make a man out of them, blah, blah, that type of thing. So uh, they were pretty supportive, I guess. He never said, uh, uh, geez, I'm thrilled that you went in the Navy, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure when, a, uh, when a son fathers, uh, follows his father into uh, the same branch, he's kind of proud of it, I would imagine. Great Lakes, Illinois right outside of Chicago. Did my, my uh, uh, boot camp there, basic training. I, I get up in the airplane, my first plane ride out of Logan Airport. And I remember looking down as I was going up and uh, saying to myself, uh, geez, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> I was a little nervous, uh, but uh, that was the start of it. And I got there and, and uh, you know, the, the intensity started uh, it, it, we we kind of went along with the plane ride, and then we got a we, we, we landed at the airport. I don't know, probably O'Hare Airport, and uh, took a bus to uh, Great Lakes. There was a whole bunch of recruits, and we get off at the uh, the main gate in front of the training center. And uh, I remember the guys looking out saying, "You'll be sorry." And you know, we were all all jokes and all laughs. You know what I mean? We we're saying, "Jesus, this is great." You know, blah blah. As soon as we walked in that door. They started calling orders and they scared the hell out of us. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, you weren't a civilian anymore. You were part of the Navy. And, uh, you know, you had some guy come over and tell you, shut your mouth. Get in line. And you were, from there on in, you were home. Oh, man, what did I get into? But that's about how it was. It was intense. Um, it was hard. I think that's, it's, that what, that's what makes or breaks you. Um, I think the basic training. The boot camp is set up to weed out the weak. If, if you can't take it, you're gone. Uh, they want to determine if, you're, if you can take the rigors of the military, uh, where I guess the military, everything is built around discipline. If, if uh, they want to be able to tell you to go over and jump off the ship into the water, and you do it because you figure it's for the good of the crew, the Navy, the country, and, and I guess that's what they're looking for. I don't know if it's changed today, but it was very, very intense back then, and you had to, you had to follow orders whether you thought they were right or wrong. You were given an order, you did it, and that was, that was how it was. 
you, you grew in that respect. You would say, geez, I, I, I can't do this. But you'd wait for the guy next to you to quit. If, if he wasn't going to quit, you couldn't quit. You didn't want to be the guy who quit. So they would push you, and, and you, you uh, if, if you, if you weren't in the military and you weren't so afraid of being punished, you would quit and say, the heck with it, I'm not going to do it. But being in the military, being, being afraid of the consequences, you did it. You meet all new friends. That's, that's, that's part of, I guess, I guess if you went away with a buddy, it might be that much easier. But, but uh, it was uh, all new guys, all new faces, uh, new places. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you get homesick. It was my first time being homesick in my life. You know, but you get through it. You, you establish a bond uh, like no other. Uh, when, you, when you eat, sleep, and, and, and do everything with, with the same guys every day, it's uh, this sort of, I guess they're like your brothers. It's about the same thing as having brothers. So you, if you're in a, a company with 80 guys, you've got 80 brothers, and that's about, the, that's about how it is. When you were done with boot camp, you did learn that uh, there was one thing I remember saying to myself, there wasn't anything that I didn't think I, I couldn't do. You know, it gave you that type of, of, of feeling. You know, if someone said, well, go ahead and do that, where in high school you'd say, that's too tough of a job, I'm not even going to try it. After the boot camp, you said, yeah, I think I can do that. I can, yeah, I can do more than I, I thought I could do. So that's what boot camp gave you. The Navy is going to send you where they figure you're going to do them the most good, and, and uh, unless you, unless you were, uh, you know, one of the um, going into offices training, or you, you know, you you were you were smart enough to to, to uh, go to school, advanced training, you know, then you could sort of call your own shots. But uh, I was just one of the regular guys, so you know, hey, here's Bill Petroni, and uh, he's going to uh, he's going to uh, where do we need him? We need him on the aircraft carrier. We'll send him there, and, and you know, I, I think that's how it was done. The training was good. Uh, I, I, would, I would think that, I've, I've talked to some of the, the, uh, the younger guys that come out of basic training, and I guess they say it's not like it used to be. I guess the intensity's in there. I guess there's, well, nothing's the same now with the news media. They watch now. Back then, if uh, they could have their way with us. Today, they have to be more accountable. You can't, you can't maim them, hurt them, and beat them up. And I, I guess you can intimidate them, but you have to watch out. Just when you're starting to get used to all the guys in basic, now you get split up again. And uh, you hit up for Norfolk. Uh, that was an experience. I remember I, uh, my first day in Norfolk, I was walking through the city of Norfolk, and uh, I got stopped for jaywalking. And uh, coming from Boston, there was no such thing as a jaywalker back in the, the 40s and 50s. And uh, here were these lights that said stop, like we have downtown here. Well, they didn't have them in Boston. They didn't have them around here, but they had them down south. So uh, I remember the uh, uh, a cop come over and he grabbed me and he said, do you realize you just, uh, you, just uh, you know, walked through that light? And I said, uh, I just crossed the street. I get, you have to wait for the light to tell you what to do or they grab you for jaywalking. So, so uh, I got a lesson in uh, you know, jaywalking. And uh, the cop said to me, he said, are, are you from Boston? He kind of knew. And I says, yeah, how'd you know? He says, because he says, we got all the guys that come down here from Boston. He said, the first thing we do is stop them for jaywalking. And uh, that was uh, that. And when I went aboard the carrier, the carrier was in dry dock. And uh, so you walk from the, the concrete apron up this ramp. You know, it's a, it's a you know, probably a, uh, a one person ramp that goes up on the ship. Now the ship was in dry dock. Uh, the ship was, from, from the bottom to the top, was 25 stories high out of water. So when you're going across this ramp, you've got your sea bag, and I looked over, and it's like being on the John Hancock and looking over, and I'll never forget that. I said to myself, I don't believe what I'm looking down at. I mean, I was up, uh, I was up probably, I wasn't up to the top of the mast, so I'd say I was close to 20 stories up, 18 stories, and I looked over and I'll never forget that. I went, holy moly. I never forgot it because I knew that, you know, later on we would play baseball and football up on the flight deck. 
And every once in a while, the ball would roll over the, uh, the flight deck. And you knew enough not to try and chase it that close to the edge because you knew it was about 20 stories into the dry dock. So uh, that was always on my mind, you know. Don't go after a football that's, uh, that's thrown too far. You've got to tow your own weight. If, if, if you don't, they see it and, and, and you, you sort of ostracize. You're an outcast. You won't last. Uh, your life will be made miserable and you'll wind up failing and probably getting, you know, taken off the ship. Uh, so you've got to, you've got to fit in. You don't just, you don't just get on there and you, and, and you run with, uh, you know, they don't welcome you with open arms. You have to prove yourself. If you prove yourself, then you're one of the boys. Uh, if not, you're, uh, you're in trouble. I know when I first got on, I, uh, they assign you to a, a division. I think it was called X Division. Uh, before you're going to go to the division they send you to, we're going to put you in X division. And you stay there for, it's like a, a holding company, you stay there for a, 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 I think a week, I believe. So they, uh, they said, these are going to be your temporary quarters for a week until we, f we find out where we're going to put you. And uh, they said, put your, yeah, you've got your sea bag, you've got all your clothes, everything is in the sea bag. They said, put your sea bag, you know, they opened up a hatch with a lock on it, put it in there. It'll be safe in there, and they close, lock it up. And, and uh, I had some clothes to last me about four days. Well, when they decide, decide they said you're going to be uh, part of V Tree Division, the hangar deck. That's where we're putting you. Go down and get your sea bag. When uh, then you, you go get the guy with the key, the guy who's supposed to be watching. And I went down to get my sea bag. There was no, there was nothing in my sea bag. It had been, it had been emptied out. <laughs> so, so I had an empty sea bag. I remember saying to myself. I guess it's like this. So that's how, that, that's part of the sink or swim process. You know, you, you, you say, you know, I said to myself, I guess I've got I've to watch out. I was a, uh, what they call an, an aircraft handling technician. Um, I was on the hangar deck of the Forrestal. There was roughly 100 planes, hard to believe, on the carrier. And we had a, we were constantly moving them parking them close by, getting them in position to go upstairs the flight deck and take off. Uh, I started off as what they call a blue shirt. You wear different colored sweatshirts on a carrier to identify what division you're in. I was a blue shirt, which meant you, you, you push the planes, you're, you, know, you handle them that way. Then I became a yellow shirt, which was a director. The director, uh, you, you've probably seen it on TV, you wave the flags you know, with wands, and you park them, you point, and you have a, the, the, the airplane captain watches you and uh, hits the brakes and all that stuff, you park them. And then became an elevator operator after that. In the Navy, there's a lot of designations. You'll see when they have a uh, insignia on their sleeve, uh, electrician, uh, uh, plumber, uh, uh, you know, a gunnery, ordnance, uh, whatever. Uh, uh, I was a aviation bosun's mate, and that was part of our job when I got on to become a, you know, a, a blue shirt. And, and you, uh, if you did a good job at that, they kept an eye on you and then they would make you a yellow shirt. Very few guys became yellow shirts. It was a big responsibility. You were, you were in charge of parking uh, um, uh, jet fighters on an aircraft carrier that cost millions of dollars. And one mistake and you just cost the government millions of dollars. So at, uh, at 17 and 18 years old, it was a big responsibility. But they kept an eye on it. They, they thought if maybe you could handle it, you'd get a shot at it. And uh, so that's, that's how I went from blue shirt to yellow shirt. We're heading to Cuba, what they call a shakedown cruise. Shakedown cruise means the, the, uh, they've done whatever they've done to the carrier to fix it up. And now they're going to test it out and, and see how it works. Shakedown cruise. They rev it up and run it and blah, blah. And, and uh, so. Uh, I remember, I think it was, it was probably January or February, it was really cold, it was freezing. I thought Norfolk was the south and it would be warm, but it's, it's like around here, it's really cold. And uh, you're freezing, you get out to sea, you're heading for Cuba, you go to bed, you get up the next day, you're sweating, it's, it's 80 degrees. <laughs> I, remember, I kind of liked that, I went, wow, this is a new experience. I went from dead of winter to 80 degrees, 90 degrees. Uh, so it was, a, it was a nice experience getting down there. And uh, I remember the, uh, they started landing airplanes. They, they, they didn't have, we didn't have any planes on the ship when we left. They flew them aboard. 
So when the plane lands, it hits the what they call the arresting gear, the hook comes down. And when it hits that arresting gear, it sounds like a 10-car collision. So I, uh, I was in a V3 division. We slept right underneath where the planes landed. So I remember waking up with a loud boom, the, the jet hitting the deck, and then this arresting gear screeching as it pulled out the, and I jumped up and I was all excited when the guys, they, it's just the planes to bring it aboard. I thought, I thought we were going down, I figured we hit something and we were getting ready to crash and go down. But the, so that was my first experience uh, out to sea. We went to Europe, we came back from the Caribbean and we headed out to Europe, uh, we had a home port uh, assigned in Europe, which was Naples, and uh, we went to Naples and, and uh, went on liberty around the whole Mediterranean. Uh, back then, Beirut wasn't all shot up, I guess, like it is today. So, as a matter of fact, uh, having liberty in Beirut was reminded me uh, the most of an American city because they had the high rises and uh, there were a lot of Texas people down there. So, we went around France and Greece and, you know, Beirut. Had a, had a pretty good time down there. It was hard work you know, on the ship, but some pretty good liberty down there. When you're out to sea, you'd go out to sea for roughly two, three, maybe four weeks, usually around between two and three weeks. And uh, it, it, after you're out there about two or three weeks, you're ready for liberty. It, it, uh, that was my first lesson in how human beings sort of change. And, and uh, uh, unlike a lot of other services, Army, Navy, Air Force, um, you don't get to do your job and then go out on liberty at night. You do your job and you're on the ship. There was no liberty. I understand today that they have some, they have uh, uh, pool tables and, and uh, gyms and, and uh, all this different thing. We didn't have that back then. You just did your job. You went up to your, to your rack and you, you wrote a letter home, uh, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so there wasn't too much recreation. So after about two or three weeks, you were ready for some liberty when you'd, and uh, you'd you'd uh, you'd know that you're you're gonna pull into say Naples, and uh, you'd be watching. The first thing you'd see way off in the distance would be uh, I think it was Mount Etna, and and uh, or Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius, and and then you'd you'd be watching. And you'd do your job. You'd look again. You get closer and closer, and you just see these these uh, you know it, it's different coming from sea pulling into a city. You know it was a it was quite an experience. And, and also, I remember seeing, seeing things like when I got to Greece, I remember seeing uh, the ruins in Greece, and then my school days would come back to me. I'd say, geez, I, I remember seeing that in the history book. You know, it's, it didn't seem real in the history book. In the history book, it was kind of boring when you're looking at all these places in Europe. But when you're right there, you go, wow, this is a real place, and this is what I was looking at. So I, I sort of got an appreciation for history and in, uh, in, uh, geography uh, by joining the Navy, by being in the Navy. It was rigorous. It, it was tough. We would have, we were flying. You're in a, you're in a, you want to maintain a state of readiness. Uh, the Cold War was going on pretty good then, and uh, so you had to stay ready. So they were constantly flying planes off and and and, and you know landing again, and we would have uh, mock uh, battles with other air forces, uh, uh, maybe uh, the Italian Air Force or the the, the French Air Force. And uh, I, I saw some mock dogfights over the ship as we were out to sea, and they were pretty interesting. They might show a, uh, a, a jet shoot down a, uh, a drone with, a, with the latest missile. You know, it was really something to see. Um, they would, and then they would push you a little bit. They would have what they call a strike X. A strike X meant uh, uh, 72 hours of flying. So for three days, they did nonstop flying. So for three days, you were up and you were ready. So they would fly, go out, do their mission, come back and land, and this went on for three days straight. Uh, you wouldn't get to, to uh, go to your bunk to sleep or, or go to uh, the, uh, the cafeteria to eat. They would send a guy down with a box and he'd get sandwiches and bring them up. You'd eat the sandwiches while you were working. And if uh, in between flights, they'd fly some planes off. 
be, you know, while you're waiting for them to come back, it might be an hour or two. You'd uh, curl up and sleep on a, there might be a plane that you'd sleep on the wing or under the wing or, you know, on the floor, wherever you could find a place to sleep. And uh, that was another thing I remember in the, uh, in the Navy, you could sleep just like that at the drop of the hat. All you had to do was so and say, you know, you get 10 minutes, you go over, you go over and just sleep for 10 minutes, something I could never do before. In the Navy, they have what they call general quarters. General quarters means they would, you'd hear a, a certain gong, 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 go off the, you know, this bell. When that went off, whenever you were doing, you had to stop what you were doing and you went to your battle station. So they would, uh, in, in the course of, it could be two in the morning, it could be three in the afternoon, whenever, you would hear that gong, gong. You got up and you ran. You had certain hatches that had to be closed. Um, uh, if the ship was ever hit, they didn't want it to go down, so you'd have to get to it. You'd have to get to your designated area, and, and you'd have to sit by your hatch. And if they gave you the word to close it, you close it. And I remember, I used to think to myself, because there was quite a bit of ship below me, and I used to think to myself, geez, if, uh, uh, if they give me the word to close this, if something's happening, there's a lot of guys down there. But see, that's, that's where the, 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 the basic training comes in. You know, if they say, dog the hatch, you dog it, and that's the end of it. And, but but you, were at this, you were at this constant state of readiness because that's the way you were trained. That's the way it was. for three weeks and we would do the land in Genoa, Italy. And uh, as we pulled into Genoa, Italy, I remember seeing someone said to me, Jesus, a Russian ship in the port. And uh, I didn't think any, it wasn't a warship, it was a, a tanker. And I remember looking down at the Russian ship and I remember seeing women working it. And I was saying, geez, look at that. You know, we, did, we didn't do that in the United States back then. You know, they had women working on the ship. And uh, I, I didn't think much of it. And uh, we started going on Liberty. A lot of the guys, where they had a, they had these Liberty launches. They would lower over the side. They were, uh, they'd hold about 80, 90 men in it. They're like big whale boats, and that's how you went on Liberty. We were too big to ever pull into a dock. So uh, I remember there were a lot of guys going on Liberty, and all of a sudden, we went to General Quarters. Very unusual during Liberty to go to General Quarters. And uh, so I know I said something's up. I said I, I said I can't believe I said this. Is this Russian ship picking a fight? <laughs> it was just some kind of a tank or something. And uh, we picked up the anchor, and uh, well, no one knew what was going on. We picked up the anchor. I figured, geez, maybe it's going to be a drill because there's a lot of guys on Liberty. Picked up the anchor, and we sailed out to sea. And, I, you know, geez, what's going on? And we found out we were heading for Cuba. And that was the start of the Cuban blockade. We spent a, a couple of weeks down there. So that was that was one time when uh, we knew it was for real and, and you had to do a little bit of thinking you know we might be going to war that was a that was quite a uh, a crisis yeah. and uh, i remember saying to myself geez i wish i was one of the guys that got ashore <laughs> because uh, like i said when you're when you're 18 years old at after two or three weeks out to sea you really need you want to go over and have a couple of beers with the guys and see the women and see the sights and, and just, you know, you're a young guy, you need this liberty. And I remember saying to myself, man, what about these guys, you know? And that's when I knew it was, it was for real. Left uh, 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 quite a few guys there and they flew back, I guess what they would call the essential personnel. Um, that's what I was told. I said, well, they'll, they'll fly back the officers and whoever they really think they need and the other guys, they'll just, uh, you know, they wind up going wherever and waiting to catch up to us, but uh, so that's how it was. We arrived on the scene and stayed out to sea with the carriers. Everybody was out to sea and, and everybody was just, just, we were just circling the island and it was just, there was ships everywhere, there was planes everywhere. And uh, I guess we were going to make sure that no Russians got in, no Russian supplies or whatever. That was pretty tense. They had a, we had a, uh, a, a couple of nuclear bombs on the ship that were, at that time, top secret, top secret, and uh, um, they were big, huge white things. They looked like mini blimps, 
They were probably about the size of a car, but they were shaped like, they were shaped like you draw a cartoon bomb. Big bulbous head on it and, and big fins. And uh, uh, these were the nuclear warheads. We weren't really supposed to know what they looked like because whenever they would parade them around, which they didn't do often, every once in a while they would have it on this cart and, and they'd, they'd take them down the, the uh, hangar deck to bring them up to put them on a plane. And they, they didn't, they really, uh, they didn't do it often because it was a nuclear warhead. Uh, but they did train a couple of times to do it. And I remember when they would come down, they would have a Marine in the front, a Marine in the back, with uh, their guns out, with 45s. And they would yell to tell you to face the bulkhead because you weren't supposed to look. So I remember, you know, you'd be working and then you'd hear this yell, face the bulkhead. And, and you had to just face the bulkhead while they walked in back. You weren't supposed to look at this. I, I, I peeked naturally a couple of times and I saw this and I went, wow. This, it looked like a little blimp. And uh, this was a nuclear warhead. So what they did was they, uh, they, they did put that, have that on a plane and they kept the plane in the air with two fighters. And they did this constantly during the, the, uh, the crisis. Uh, uh, I was told that if a ship was ever hit, the carrier, and actually the carrier would be a prize. Uh, you're taking a, a, a over 4,000 guys and, and, and 100 planes out of action. I mean, it would be a big loss. So they kept this here plane up there with the nuclear warhead. We had kind of a nice day when that was going on because we didn't have to really work. We weren't practicing putting up planes, we were just sort of sitting back and resting because this is the route we're waiting for, we're waiting to bomb someone, I get bombed, so you just waited. We had a lot more destroyers next to us. Uh, I guess the way it works out, the, the, uh, the carrier is the mother ship in the fleet, and, and now that we're actually might be going to war, the destroyers, this, there seemed to be a lot more destroyers, and they were closed in around us. I guess their idea was to protect us because we get reports that there's a, uh, there's a lot of Soviet subs around. I guess the Soviets were, were, were famous for their subs. They made more subs than I guess anybody else. So we'd hear that, you know, you know um, Jesus, a lot of subs around, and, and that's why they've got the destroyers around. And, and then we started seeing the Soviet uh, destroyers showing up on the scene. And uh, there was a lot of posturing going on. The, the uh, Soviet subs might get a little bit too close to the carrier. So we'd have an American destroyer, we'd cut it off, and the guns were going around and waving up and down, and I was saying, this is beautiful, we're going to have a walk. You know, at 18, I mean, you know, that's how we felt. This is great, some action for a change. It was pretty tense. We had, uh, we had Marines, you know, they were constantly training. They got their guns, and then we had a, we had a landing party of, uh, of sailors. We had 100 Marines under the detachment. They were in charge of... Uh, anything to do with guns, and then they trained probably, I'm guessing, maybe two or three hundred, four hundred sailors were trained in case we ever landed on the beach, I guess, the Marines were going to land with this detachment of, of three, four hundred sailors. So everybody was in a state of readiness. We saw a lot of, I remember seeing a lot of Marines with packs on and, and saying to myself, this is a little bit more serious than I thought, because it looked like, you know, this is going to be, this is for real, this is an invasion. So to a lot of Marines, you didn't see any dress uniforms like you usually saw in the Marines. You saw them all fatigues, and uh, they had packs, and they were, I guess for a while there, we, we, it was pretty close to uh, an, an invasion of Cuba. A couple of times, uh, uh, we had a, uh, we'd go to general quarters, even though we were at the ready in Cuba, and we'd go to general quarters, and let's say, what's up, and they'd say, two, uh, 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 Russian MiGs just went overhead, I guess the Russian MiGs. And then you'd have American fighters chasing them. And, you know, it was a lot of fun watching that. Uh, we had what they call a Russian bear went over us, a big, huge uh, airplane. It had about, I don't know, eight engines on it. Big, huge thing like I never saw. That come flying over us. So we were general quarters for that. And, you, know. you never really, with the might, with the might of the United States Navy, you never really you didn't have that sense of fear. I used to pity everyone else. I used to say, who can, who can go up against us? We never really saw a, a, a formidable foe out to sea. I remember a few destroyers. There was always talk of, 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 uh, of submarines as, uh, you know, why, why, is, why is that, uh, how come that destroyer just came in real quick over there? Someone said, well, was, I think there's a there's submarine out there, so they have to block it off. And, you know, it was, it was that type of thing. But, uh, as far as Russian ships, there was 
probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe 12, 15 destroyers that we saw. And there was always that talk about there's 30 subs around us, you know, but who knows, someone could make that up, you know. It didn't scare me, I was getting, I was getting mail from aunts, uncles, and family, and they were saying they just can't believe how, uh, how, how bad things are, and, 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 and am I afraid, and am I terrified, and I remember saying to myself, you know, I'm, I'm having a ball. <laughs> This is, this is great. I'm really not working hard because during the blockade, like I say, we were in a state of readiness. They had this plane up there with this nuclear warhead and you had a couple of fighter jets watching it. I, I think, I'm not sure, but I think that before that plane would land with the nuclear warhead, they sent another one off. Then it came in and landed. So there was constantly, we were never left so that you could never get the ship. And that was the end of it. We were if the ship was hit, there was going to be a nuclear war, a nuclear warhead up there. With the way things were, it was kind of easy. Uh, you know, I never, uh, I was never scared. Um, I, I think, uh, I think maybe we were, uh, we might have been too, too stupid to be scared. You know what I mean? We were just, we were too young. We just didn't, you know, we we welcomed any kind of action. You know, and I was, I was pretty, I was a little bit uh, mad that I didn't get to go to uh, uh, Liberty in, in Genoa. So. As far as I was concerned, we might as well have a war because what the hell, I didn't get liberty. But I mean, that was the mindset. That's how, that's how loose we were then. You, you're too young to realize the experience. Um, it wasn't until I got out of the service, and, and actually they made movies about it, that I realized just how tense the situation was. To us, like I was saying, I remember, I remember, I remember just being mad that I didn't go on liberty in general. I really wanted to go on liberty in general. Now I'm out to sea for, now we're talking over a month, you know, and, and uh, it was a strange thing. Um, you, you, uh, the personality sour after a couple of weeks at sea. I used to notice that, where, where there were a lot of, hey, how you doing, Joe? You know, good morning, blah, blah, blah. That kind of stopped after a while. It was kind of like you go by and grunt at someone, you know, you're a little bit, you know, at 18, you need, you, you need a little freedom. You say to yourself, wow, I didn't realize it at the time. Um, um, the first time I realized it was when I got the letters. And the letters come in and I went, geez, Billy, we were lucky and weren't you scared? And, and, and I remember saying, wow, these, you know, they, they think we're big shots here. You know, it was nothing, it was a piece of cake, you know. Uh, it, uh, we didn't, uh, I was never afraid, but I guess everybody back here was afraid. You were exposed to the, uh, we didn't have televisions and, 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 and radios. We, we didn't know what was really going on. We were in our own little world out to sea. We could see what was going on. We could see that it was pretty serious. Well, there was only one blockade, that was it. After that, it was business as usual. Just, you know, flying and, and, and just, you know, mock wars. You know, every once in a while we'd, we'd see, a, you know, we'd, we'd get buzzed by, say, the French Air Force. Uh, you'd go, wow, what's that? You see these jets coming at you and, and, and uh, coming down the water and go right over the flight deck. And we'd go, what the heck, you know? Uh, and I, I remember saying to myself, geez, if we were in a war, I guess we'd be dead. But then right behind it would be a bunch of American jets chasing them, you know, and having them. So it was, it was just standard war games constantly, constantly staying ready. So if anything happens, you're ready to go. When I say business as usual, business as usual, um, we, lost, we lost 20 guys on a med cruise, 20 guys killed. So even though it's business as usual, on any given day, a minute, you're, you, you're, you're looking out to stay alive because of the complexity of an aircraft carrier with the planes on it. Um, we had a couple of guys walk in a propellers. We have propeller fighters on the ship back then. Uh, we had a couple of guys walk into them uh, and get killed. Um, uh, you had, uh, you had uh, uh, pilots that when they went on their mission never came back, crashed into the sea. Um, uh, a man might fall overboard. So even though it was business as usual, it was a pretty, uh, it was pretty intense. You know, you had to watch out.
had a uh, Phantom jet which had two pilots in it. The Phantom jet was the old the fighter they used in the Vietnam War. We had a Phantom jet take off at night and went out, never gained the altitude, went out about a mile and hit the water. And uh, we lost both guys. We, we passed the plane. The ship was so big, I think it was a, a full mile to make a turn. But we passed the plane. We saw the guys getting onto the wings and inflate their May West. Uh, the guys from the flight deck used to use uh, uh, a flashlight with a plastic wand on it. Came up to a point. You've probably seen them at the airports when they flag the planes in. I, the guys were throwing the wands at the plane to mark the spot. And when we come back, there was no plane, no guys. So, so uh, you know, we stayed out there a couple of days looking for them. Never found them. We had a plane crash once. The flight deck it came in and it, it went half over the, the flight deck. It was landing at an angle. And uh, one of the guys, they had, they had different uh, uh, crews, different jobs. They had a repair crew. They had to jump on it and, and put slings on it to pull it back on. One of the guys fell off into the water and uh, we never got him. It seemed to me that if you went into the water of at sea, you weren't going to come back. That was something I never forgot. And, and, and uh, uh, there, was, there was one thing that I learned to fear, and that was the ocean. And it stayed with me till today. I, I think I appreciate it more than uh, uh, anybody who hasn't been in the Navy. If you've been in the Navy, you've got a pretty good uh, uh, feel for the sea. If you haven't been, you really don't know how scary it can be out there. As I get closer to my time, I remember becoming a little paranoid. Uh, it was a feeling I never, I never had before, but I, I would say the last month or so, I was real nervous about something happening to me. Uh, it was something that, it was like a feeling you couldn't control. And uh, I think what triggered it was the fact that I was finally, I was going to get discharged. And uh, uh, before that, you just had this feeling of doing the everyday routine. When you know that, you don't think about the end coming. When you see the end of your tour coming, you say to yourself, geez, I'm going to get out. Then you start to worry. Geez, I hope nothing happens to me. So I remember being uh, really, that, that feeling was pretty strong, you know. I've got to, I've got to make this next two weeks. I've got to survive it because it was, uh, you know, you saw a lot, you knew a lot that happened. You didn't want it to happen when you were getting ready to get out. It was a great feeling. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get out. Uh, uh, most of the guys I hung with, well, all the guys I hung with were all from New York City. Um, you're sort of growing up in, 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 uh, in Boston, coming from Oxbury, um, you, you pair up with guys you know, that, that uh, you feel comfortable with. And uh, I remember I hung out with all New York City guys. There weren't any Boston guys, so it was all New York City guys. Uh, uh, and then the, uh, the guys from the, uh, the South, they sort of, sort of hung out together. You know, they, so, you know, it, it was, you had a lot of your groups like that. Uh, so I remember when I was, all the guys from New York City, they got discharged a month to two months ahead of me. And I wrote my mother and told her, I said, I'm getting discharged, blah, blah, blah. I said, I'm going to uh, stop off and, and see some of the guys before I come home. And uh, I remember taking a bus from Norfolk to Port Authority, New York. You get off there and then take another bus to Boston. And when I got off the bus in Port Authority, there was my mother, father, and sisters and brothers all sitting on the bench there. And I got off and I went, what's going on? <laughs> they said, come on, we're going to go over. We're gonna get some spaghetti and meatballs across the street, and then we're driving back to Boston. And I said, geez, Mom, how come? What's going on? You ruined my plans. I don't know. She says, I'm, I was afraid I'd never see you again. She says, you'd stay here in New York. So, <laughs> so that's how it was on discharge day. I, I did my tour, and that was it. Um, the, the next time you think about doing that is, you're probably 30 years down the line. You start thinking back, and I think that's, that might be because you're starting to get old. And, and you might think of signing up again because it probably coincides with being young again, you know what I mean? Uh, if, it, if, I was, if I was 20 right now, I'd sign up for 20 years in the Navy and I'd say, okay, I'm going in for 20, what do I care, you know what I mean? But that, it's, it's that type of thing, you know. You associate it with your youth and you miss the guys that you, you're in there with. I've tried to get in touch with them over the last couple of three years, but I can't get in touch with anybody. I guess they're all retired and probably down south, uh, who knows what they're doing, but uh, uh, 
I'd like to get in touch with some of them, but it's tough. It's been, it's been 42, 42 years, 43 years since I've been this child, so been a long time. The most positive thing, I think the friends you meet, the friendship, um, you're really, the guys that you, that you live with in the service, it was, it was really, you, you'll never know that unless you are in. It's like having 80 brothers. Uh, when you get on a ship, it, it increased, it was even more. I think there was 80 guys in my division, 60 or 80 guys in my division. It's like having, they were all brothers. And then on the ship, you know, it's, it, it, it's you against the world. It's, it's just you guys, you know. There's, there's no mothers and no fathers, just all brothers. And it, it was, that's the highlight. It, it was a good, the camaraderie, it was a good feeling. I miss them now, you know. But um, I don't know how many are alive. I don't know where they'd be, but uh, I'd like to bump into some of them. I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I was always proud of it. I, uh, I noticed I finished out my, my, uh, my career teaching in a vocational high school, teaching masonry, and I noticed that uh, there, weren't, there were very few veterans. Uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're climbing back into the veteran pool now with what's been going on, you know, over in the, uh, the Gulf Wars and all that. So uh, uh, I, I, uh, I was always proud that uh, y you have that feeling of camaraderie when you bump into another veteran. I wouldn't say it was a high point. I guess high points would be when you, when you have your kids, grandchildren, you know. Th those would be high points. That was just, that was part of your duty. That was the way it was. It, it was, it, it was kind of expected. You didn't have to draft us. We, we just went in. 